Well, today uh, we're going to be politically correct. Uh, we often talk about brave men running running around in boats and ships and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but we're going to talk uh, today uh, about a uh, outstanding uh, young woman, Kathleen Muriel Butler. And there is a maritime connection. Uh, you may be wondering, well, what the hell's this got to do uh, uh, with uh, the things we normally talk about? The uh, maritime connection, it's all about the construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge across lots of water. And to give us the presentation, we've got Bill Fippen, who's well qualified to do this, a civil engineer by profession, an author of five interesting, very interesting books, uh, Engineering Heritage, uh, and uh, he's uh, been awarded uh, an OAM for his work with the disabled. And uh, he's also a volunteer guide and a speaker at the Maritime Museum in Darling Harbour. So, uh, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Noel. It's uh, it's good to be here. I Before I begin the talk, I do have to acknowledge that a lot of support I've been given by other people, and uh, women, for that matter. Um, Cheryl Evans is a, a museum curator in London who's never been to Sydney or Australia, uh, and she did much of the early legwork on this. And I do have to acknowledge the work of my sister, Angela. She It's very handy having a genealogist on the team when you're trying to sort of look up um, people in history. And as you, it become very apparent as we go through the talk, um, a lot of the photos and things you will see are obviously family, personal things. So I must acknowledge the support given to this project by Maria Sloan, who is the granddaughter of Kathleen and lives in Toowoomba. On the 26th of December, 1923, which was in fact his 56th birthday, John Bradfield, mastermind of the transport revolution in Sydney in the first decades of the 20th century, signed his thesis for the degree of Doctor of Science in Engineering at the University of Sydney. The degree had never been awarded and would not be awarded again until the 1970s. And in his thesis, Bradfield only acknowledged two people. One, who scored a single line was his old professor, his old teacher, Professor William Warren, founder of the School of Engineering at Sydney University. The other was Kathleen Muriel Butler. In fact, she could well have typed the massive 260 page document with all its figures and photographs. But Bradfield's admiration for his confidential secretary recognized much more than her typing and graphic design skills. A branch within the Public Works Department, which would build a bridge uh, and the Underground Railway, was established under Bradfield in 1912. He writes, The first officer appointed to the branch was Miss K.M. Butler, now my confidential secretary. She has at all times carried out her duties with foresight, tact, and marked ability. In preparing the specification for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, she was my only assistant. The technique of the specification is hers, and it would, I think, be impossible to find a better arranged or better printed specification. During my absence abroad in 1922, she carried out all correspondence with the tenderers throughout the world herself. She is present at all interviews with tenderers in Sydney, and myself ex accepted, she alone knows of the many issues involved in tendering for the bridge. Her conscientious and and efficient help has materially lightened the responsibility which the design and construction of these great engineering works have entailed. And in this, my thesis, I wish to place on record my sincere thanks to the lady for her invaluable assistance. High praise indeed from a man it is generally agreed was not easy to work for. What he could not say then was that only a few months later, once the contract for the bridge had been awarded to Dorman Long, Butler would go to London for many months as head of the team to open an office and negotiate details of the contract with the winning tenderers, pending his arrival three months later. Some newspapers, perhaps tongue-in-cheek, later referred to the Bradfield-Butler bridge builders, and Butler was referred to as the bridge girl or the godmother of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. These were the days of emerging feminism, especially in the United Kingdom, where not all women could vote, and Butler became the darling of those wishing to promote the role of women in all aspects of society. Where had she come from? Kathleen Butler had been born in Lithgow on the 27th of February, 1891, 
to an Irish mother and an English father. Eventually, there would be seven children in the family. Her father, William Henry Butler, was an English railwayman who came to Australia in 1878 and from 1879 would spend his whole 33-year career in the New South, Wales, New South Wales Railways at Mount Victoria, except for a probationary year at Lithgow and a month at Clarence Siding in 1908. For the last nine years until 1913, he was the station master. At least three other members of her family would join the railway service, elder brother George Henry Butler in the traffic branch where he rose to be a senior traffic inspector and younger, younger siblings Roger as a civil engineer working with her on the bridge and Arthur Augustus served 51 years from 1917 as a clerk and timekeeper in the locomotive branch. Butler later attributed her technical ability with numbers and drawings to her mother Annie Gaffney who was remarkably clever at drawing plans of houses and supervising buildings. She also stated in an interview that Bradfield from the beginning encouraged her interest in all mathematical calculations and conditions connection in connected with engineering works. We may say that she was unqualified and she had not done four years at a university, but 15 years of one-on-one -on -one tutoring by an engineer of Bradfield's caliber must count for something. Kathleen attended school in Mount Victoria and later Mount, at Mount St. Mary's Convent in Katoomba. On leaving school sometime before 1910, Kathleen was appointed as a clerk and typist in the New South Wales Government Testing Office at the Lithgow Ironworks, intended to check the quality of material produced there. I just love this photo. It's just sort of fell into my lap sort of fairly recently. It's dated 1909. On the window, you can see Department of Public Works testing office. It's Lithgow, and the, it, the photo's dated, and it's a Thursday. So I reckon Kathleen's inside the building there in that photo. In 1910, age 19, she transferred to the Public Works Department in Sydney, where she must have soon met Bradfield, who, who recognised her talents and had her appointed in 1912 to his new Sydney Harbour Bridge and City Transit branch, its first employee, as we've heard. She lived at number three, Mill Street, Helston Park, and I think the house still stands. According to the English suffrage newspaper, The Vote, during the next decade, she, quote, mastered all sorts of intricate technical matters of engineering. In 1914, Bradfield made a world fact-finding tour to North America, the United Kingdom and Europe, seeking to learn about big bridges and underground railways. We all know that he wrote his voluminous report on the long ship voyage home, presented it to the government, and that the city railway was commissioned by Act of Parliament in 1915. The truth is that he probably wrote in longhand and handed a sheaf of pages to Butler on the wharf, and she set it out, typed it up, and arranged for its printing, learning all the while. Across the top of that... Uh, image of the play of the report you can see an extract from her public works department um, re uh, employment record where it says she was paid a, an allowance for typing the report the railway was commenced in 1916 but work soon ended as the great war siphoned off the funds work was abandoned for five years before resuming in february 1922 uh, the photo on the left is botanic gardens government house area uh, between 1917 and 1930, that's what the Botanic Gardens look like, abandoned for uh, more than a decade. And the photo on the right is the resumption of work in February 1922, uh, muscle of man and horse, horses and ploughs. And by that time, the Harbour Bridge was also becoming a real possibility. Tenders had been called in late 1921, and an act to authorise its construction was eventually passed late in November 1922, but even while the debate in Parliament raged, Bradfield was off touring the world again, trying to convince tenderers to make the effort to submit a price, as he asserted that this time, after so many false starts, the government was sincere, though the bill had not yet been passed. The ultimately successful passage of the bill through the Parliament was due to the efforts of many members, especially from the North Shore, but also Butler, who wrote the accompanying notes, which all hailed as crucial to its passage. With Bradfield away, all public officer support to the parliament was through Butler. 
1924, one of the articles which she wrote for the Sydney Mail recounted the administrative and political tale of the passage of the bill and included portraits of all the players, all men except one, herself. When the news of the final approval of the bridge came through, the Blue Mountains Echo, perhaps parochially proud of their local hero, rose to the occasion. If the worn-out term the weaker sex meant that women are intellectually inferior to man in brain possibilities, Miss Kathleen Butler, secretary and clerk to Mr Judge O.C. Bradfield, would put the argument all askew. Mr Bradfield is the father of the bridge, but Miss Butler is the godmother. At the same time as she, as she was supporting the bill through the parliament, Butler was the officer charged with dealing with tenderers, some of whom had their people in Sydney and otherwise by letter or cable. One particularly dramatic incident occurred in May 1922, when a change in government made state cabinet lose enthusiasm for the bridge and resolved to cable Bradfield, then in New York, to advise him to stay there and await instructions. This fact is documented by newspaper reports, as you can see on the screen. According to Richard Raxworthy in his biography of Bradfield, and he cites the name of Harold Peach and a tape number in an oral history at the Mitchell Library, Kathleen Butler circumvented the official cable by getting to Bradfield first and telling him to leave town. He was already on the Atlantic when the official cable arrived. This is not as implausible as it sounds, as she would have known his exact whereabouts as she was exchanging cables with him frequently about work. While the government was probably, probably relying on the address given in the call for tenders, care of the Minister for Railways, Ottawa, Canada, because we couldn't deal with the Americans. They weren't Empire Brothers, were they? We had to deal through the Canadians. And Bradfield was in New York. She was clearly more than a clerk and a typist and was paid an honorarium of £25 in recognition of services provided during Mr Bradfield's absence. Bradfield's conversations on his 1922 trip had convinced him that the arch bridge he preferred was indeed buildable and that capable firms were available and willing to do the work and so the Act and the specification were amended to allow for the option. In all these specifications and amendments, we can only take Bradfield at his word. In preparing the specifications for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, she was my only assistant. The technique of the specification is hers, and it would, I think, be impossible to find a better arranged or better printed specification. Tenders closed for the bridge at noon on the 16th of January, 1924. And when the tender box was opened that later that day, those present in the room were Bradfield, T.B. Cooper, the Under Secretary of Works, Richard Ball, the Minister for Works and Railways, his secretary, A.H. Swift, and Kathleen Butler. Butler, uh, Bradfield, Butler, and engineer Gordon Stuckey immediately set to work to assess the tenders. In her own words, we were working on this report for six weeks, night and day, because the tenderers were all waiting to hear their fate and we wanted to let them get back to America, to England and Canada as soon as possible. I think I know that report and the specifications off by heart. Those were exciting days. I was the only woman present in the minister's room when the tenders were opened. It was a most exciting moment. I, find, I found a typescript copy of the report in the National Library of Australia catalogue. I went there hoping that it may have the KMB initials at the foot of the page or something like that as the typist or the stenographer, but it doesn't. It is signed by Kathleen Butler alongside Bradfield's signature, as you can see in, the, in my photograph of the document on the table at the National Library. On the 26th of February, Dorman Long and Company were confirmed as the winning contractors after several days where Bradfield's recommendation and Ball's acceptance of his advice seemed to have been widely known in the press. And the question was only if or when State Cabinet would agree. On the 24th of March, Ball signed the contract in his office. Those present were obviously a legal officer, R.G. Allman, Bradfield, Cooper, and Kathleen Butler. Lawrence Ennis, director of the company, was in Sydney to sign the contract on behalf of Dorman Long. Another photograph exists, which does not appear to be any particular occasion, merely captioned as the officers responsible for the passage of the bill, Bradfield, Cooper, Ball and Butler. Butler was granted a bonus of £50 in connection with the Sydney Harbour Bridge tenders. 
A set of four intriguing photographs exist from this period. They show Bradfield, Ball, Ennis and Butler, as well as George Camille Ambo, consulting engineer to Dorman Long, posing in a mock-up of the bridge cord section and in front of a large steel cylinder. The images must have been created the 26th of February 1924, when Ambo and Ennis were recognised as being representatives of the winning tenderers, and before the 12th of March, when the images were published in the Sydney Mail. But what is the cylinder? The Sydney Mail, and therefore Bradfield slash Butler, captions the photo as the end pin. The four main pins are each 10 foot 6 long and 4 feet 4 inches in diameter. The pins, as they exist now, are only a quarter of that diameter and were clearly not fabricated for several years after 1924. The cylinder is a mock-up, a publicity stunt. Close inspection shows rivets on the end face and possibly a dent in the sheet metal from which it is made. A press release by Richard Ball, nine years later in 1933, talks of being taken to Dorman Long's factory in Mascot by Bradfield and Ennis, and there viewing a model of the bearing pin four feet in diameter. So the thing must have been made by Dorman Long as a prop to their tender. If nothing else, it illustrates the central role that Kathleen Butler was playing in the project. Bradfield was not only the engineer designing the bridge, but a man driving the project through what we would now call public relations. And in this, he was ably assisted by his confederate, Kathleen Butler. From late 1922 until early 1927, 29 articles were published in the Sydney Mail, a weekly magazine-type newspaper, usually with the heading written by Kathleen Butler from the notes of Mr. J.J.C. Bradfield. Not all have the heading. A few have the name at the end of the article, and some are not credited. However, there exists in the Mitchell Library two volumes of bound, complete newspapers. All 29, in fact. And on the cover of the first volume is embossed, Articles on the Sydney Harbour Bridge by Kathleen M. Butler. So it is reasonable to attribute them all to her. The articles are generally technical and are often, as the head heading indicates, drawn straight from Bradfield. His 1915 report, his 1924 thesis, and the report on tenders. But Butler topped and tailed, cut and pasted, supplied photos and diagrams, and delivered copy to the Sydney Mail. Maybe she could do that, as she knew them all off by heart. They are, of course, highly complementary to Bradfield, the genius engineer solving all of Sydney's transport problems, so it is probably best that someone else had their name at the head. Butler also had two articles, basically collated from the Sydney articles published in The Woman Engineer in the United Kingdom. My thought is that these two books were in the possession of Butler until near the end of her life. They were donated to the library in early 1972, and she died in July. There is a typed contents page in each volume, probably Butler's own work, I guess, because originally she was a typist. There is another document in the Mitchell Library associated with Butler. During the demolition of the Water Police building at Dawes Point, a stone was found inscribed RR 1789. It was obviously significant and it was preserved and it now too is in the Mitchell Library. One day I'm going to ask for it to see it and I'm going to watch them struggle out with a two-ton block, but I'm never game. Butler wrote this letter, setting out where it was found by precise measurement from the bridge survey and the precise latitude and longitude of Dawes Original Observatory. You've probably realised by now that I get very moved by old bits of paper and this one has Butler's original signature on it. Yes, I did run my finger along it, this being the Mitchell Library and not State Records, an ungloved finger at that. About the most exciting thing I have done since I found an original letter by Edwin Kirtland Morse uh, in, in State Records. Um, he built the Hawkesbury River Railway Bridge in, in 1889, and I do have a certain uh, vested interest in that bridge. To further assure prospective bridge builders, while the tendering process was still in hand and the work would proceed, on 28th of July 1923, there had been a ceremonial turning of the first site at the site of North Sydney Station. As well as impressing the firms expending time and money on costing the bridge, it was important to extend the railway from Bay Road, now Waverton, through the future site of North Sydney Station into the bridge approaches to allow delivery of tens and hundreds of thousands of tonnes of material as soon as possible. Work commenced on the next Monday when Bradfield ceremonially turned the key in the door of the site office. For once, Butler wasn't there. 
Excavation proceeded quite quickly and Butler was often photographed on site. This one is captioned the first act of construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and shows Butler turning the switch to start the air compressor and then 10 minutes later of supervising the drilling of the first hole in the sandstone. Of course, the engineers, commissioners and ministers wore three-piece suits, high collars and hats rather than reflective vests and boots, while Butler dressed as the very elegant young woman that she was rather than as a construction worker. At this time, she was doing quarterly reports on the progress of the work for the Sydney Mail, and perhaps her report on the drilling and blasting is more of her own words than some of the other articles. It does not read like Bradfield to me, at least. On September 19th, which is almost exactly 100 years ago, yesterday it was 100 years ago, the writer switched on the current of number one compressor and set the machinery in motion. Three compressors are now in operation. When the current is switched on, the throb of the compressors, the quick, sharp chatter of the drills, and the hiss of the escaping air indicate that construction has begun. And after a century of waiting, Sydney and North Sydney are now being joined with steel and stone. After the holes are drilled in the rock, they are charged with lithite. The firing wires adjusted, the holes tamped with earth and covered with heavy rope mat mattresses to prevent the debris from flying high after the explosion. The traffic in the vicinity is then warned by means of red flags. The fire, the call, fire, 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 warns the workmen to get the cover. The powder monkey connects the wires to the firing battery, presses the trigger, and immediately the rock heaves outward and upward, carrying the mattress skyward. North Sydney reverberates to the dull roar of the explosion, and a few of those paying the bridge tax may perhaps realise that some of their money is going up in fire and smoke and non-political thunder. The geological formation of centuries is destroyed in seconds. There are quite a lot of photos of Butler at North Sydney, and I'll run through them quickly. Not that you will get to see them, but you'll just get to see how many there are. So in February 1924, Norman Long and company were awarded the job, but much of the work, including all the design calculations, was to be done in England, and the steel was to be rolled at Middlesbrough. There were many details which needed to be settled and that had to be done in England. So a team had to go there and an office opened in the London premises of Dorman Long. Three young male Australian civil engineers, Gordon Stuckey, James Holt and Owen Powis, all trained at Sydney University went. But who led the party? Kathleen Butler, of course. And she was paid more than any of them, despite their qualifications. And they were young. Stuckey was 24 the departure date was Holt's 25th birthday, and Powers was also just 24. Butler, Holt, and Powers left Sydney on the SS Ormond on the 30th of April 24, while for some reason Stuckey had left the day before on the SS Largs Bay. The scene at the wharf as the ship left may have been normal, but the vessel was also carrying the Australian Olympic team to the 1924 London Olympics, so perhaps there was extra fanfare. Bradfield followed, leaving Sydney on the 30th of July, thus three months later. Mary Bradfield, John and Edith's daughter, was supposed to go with her father, but she was so seasick she abandoned the trip in Perth and returned by train. Lest JJC Bradfield be held up as too much of a feminist icon, it should be pointed out that he decreed the profession that each of his six children would follow, medicine, law, etc. But the only daughter, Mary, was forbidden to marry so that she should remain at home to care for John and Edith in their old age. And she did. I heard that story from Bradfield's great-granddaughter, Vanessa Creek, sitting at his kitchen table in her Meadowbank flat a few months ago. Butler's salary had been £360 per annum, plus £40 allowance per annum. But, but now it was increased overnight to £500, plus £10 per week whilst in London. The pay rate remained at that level for the rest of her career, even after she returned to Australia. She was paid more than her brother Roger, a qualified civil engineer working on the bridge. Butler set up the office for herself, the three engineers, and later Bradfield, and dealt with Lawman, Dorman Long as work on the bridge got underway. While she was in England in August 1924, she was added to the Buildings, Bells and Funds Subcommittee of the War Memorial Committee at Sydney University managing the procurement and installation of a set of bells as a war memorial in a tower of the quadrangle. 
Bradfield was on this committee and the bells were being cast in England. So it must have been expedient to have someone with a formal connection to the Sydney committee on hand. Brad, uh, Butler was not only dealing with Norman Long, but also with the Bell founders, John Taylor and company of Loughborough, Leicestershire. She retained this committee membership for the rest of her career. In her time in England, she attended Carillion recitals at the Wembley Exhibition to learn of the art. Now, the U United Kingdom in 1924 was nearing the end of at least one phase of a great debate about the role of women and their right to vote. Australian women had always been eligible to vote in federal elections, but women in the UK had only gained this right partially in 1918 when women over 30 who satisfied a property qualification, albeit two-thirds of the adult female population, had been allowed to vote. Universal suffrage for all at 21 years of age would not come until 1928. An elegant young woman with such an important role in building the biggest bridge in the world was a sensation. She was fated by the Women's Engineering Society, which had only been founded in 1920. Articles about her were published in, in newspapers such as The Vote, the organ of the Women's Freedom League, and the International Women's Suffrage uh, News. Butler received invitations to all Women's Engineering Society functions, but could attend few as she was so busy. The woman engineer published an article about her and an article about the bridge by her. She was made a member of the Cowdray Club for Professional Women and even attended a royal garden party at Buckingham Palace. On the 8th of October 1924, she visited the Dorman Long Redcar Steelworks and was presented with an engraved jewellery box made from the first steel rolled for the bridge. Uh, on the left of that slide, you can see a contemporary report how they, from the first steel roll, they made a paperweight and an inkwell and a knife and a, and a jewellery box. And of course, on the right, you can see the jewellery box because it is still in the possession of Kathleen's granddaughter in Toowoomba. Numerous newspapers in England and Ireland in included columns about her work. Heady days indeed for a young woman from Mount Victoria. Butler returned through the United States and Canada with Bradfield and the three engineers, crossing the Atlantic on the to New York on the 27th of November, then overland to Vancouver, arriving in Sydney on the 10th of January 1925. On the way, the group inspected many bridges, including the Hellgate Bridge and the Quebec Bridge. Very much an engineer's inspection rather than that of a tourist, she told the evening news reporter in Sydney later, at Hellgate, I had to sign an indemnity stating that I voluntarily accepted all risk of injury. I have a copy of the indemnity still. When the bridge inspector saw me on the bridge, he came over to our party and asked to see our permits. These were all in order, and he told me that he came because he had never seen a lady on the bridge, and he had been there ever since the bridge was open to traffic in 1916. In Toronto, she donned her University of Sydney Bell subcommittee hat and inspected the memorial carillion of 23 bells presented to the Metropolitan Methodist Church. The 23 bells weigh about 20 tonnes, the largest bell, the tenor, weighing about four tonnes. And at Niagara, watching the new arch bridge being built, she reported, at the time of our visit, the cords and wind bracing of the new arch bridge were being riveted up. The rivets being driven by pneumatic hammers. They were heated in coke furnaces and the rivets were thrown one at a time to a riveter's labourer who caught them in a tin and passed them on to the riveter. The man heating and throwing the rivets and the labourers catching them were, were very expert. And during the time we were watching, standing almost knee deep in the snow, they never missed a rivet. She, she was certainly very interested in the art of bridge building and could talk the talk. An incident which may shed some light on her relationship with Bradfield probably occurred at the wharf once the ship Multan docked. An evening news reporter ignorantly asked Bradfield if he knew that work had started on both sides of the harbour on the bridge. Bradfield replied, oh yes, I'm aware of everything that's been done. Yes, we got numerous cables, interposed Miss Butler. The Lithgow Mercury reported on a welcome home gathering arranged by her brother Will at the Imperial Hotel in Lithgow. He was the proprietor of the establishment and had arranged a symphony band to render a program of music on the balcony and extended his personal liquid compliment to all persons in the Imperial at five o'clock. At the end of the event, Kathleen remarked that she would return to Sydney on Monday and on Tuesday enter in, in earnest on the six-year job of constructing the Harbour Bridge. 
Kathleen was fated by women's groups in Sydney as she had been in London. She was lunched by the Professional Women Workers Association at Farmers. One report of this event quotes Bradfield, Dr. Bradfield himself said before he left for England that without the assistance of this Australian girl, he might never have been able to bring the great scheme to a successful issue. Miss Grace Scobie, the president, stated, the unique position which Miss Kathleen Butler holds in Sydney today is owing to the fact that Dr. Bradfield dares to place a woman in a position of trust where merit, capacity and initiative counts. Mrs. Jamison Williams added, we don't want sentimental tosh about man's protecting arm. That is an exploded theory. We want men like Dr. Bradfield to say, she has brains and ability, and we will put her where she will have a chance to show her powers. We don't want a woman's world. We don't want a man's world. We want a human world. Kathleen responded with, quote, an interesting report of her work. To be balanced, the bulletin gave a somewhat more cynical view of the same lunch. I do love reading these pieces as this old stuff is so beautifully written. When a doctor taps your ribs and rumbles, say 99, you know he's looking for trouble. And that's what any man would have been looking for who had denied the equality of the sexes before the 99 good women and true who ate to the honour of Kathleen Butler the other day. Kathleen is the girl who is helping doc Dr. Bradfield build the bridge. She has been the faithful scribe who has kept her tablets bright and her typewriter running smooth for 10 years that the harbour might be spanned from shore to shore. So you see, she has laboured three years more than Jacob did for his Rachel. But in the end, she got her reward and the professional women workers rallied around in their best slim silhouettes and plumy helmets and drank her health in iced water and dry speeches. Some of them were Sahara-like too with an occasional oasis when Dr. Grace Belkey threw in a momentary twinkler over proceedings and Grace Scobie passed words like a benediction around the board. Kathleen, who is a tall, capable young woman with wide apart serious eyes, dressed her russet colouring in the same shades and in place of a speech read something very like a bridge specification to the defenceless listeners. Perhaps we have an example of her public speaking style in a quoted report in the Sunday Times of the 11th of January. In Philadelphia, I saw the new suspension bridge of 1,750 feet span being constructed. The cables were being spun at the date of our visit, November 24. Each cable will consist of 61 strands of 306 wires each, or 18,666 wires in each cable. Each wire had an ultimate strength of 223,000 pounds per square inch. This is the highest grade of wire yet used in bridge construction. The spider, which takes two wires across at a time, is hauled backwards and forwards by means of an endless wire rope passing over two large wheels at either side. Each pair of wires is placed in position in nine minutes. If the wires have to be spliced, it is done by means of a union screw. On the bridge, one of the first needs was for an accurately surveyed centre line and a precise distance between fixed marks on opposite sides of the harbour. One of Butler's articles in the Sydney Mail was about precisely this subject. It was probably one she really wrote herself as it explains the process in layman's terms how two carefully measured baselines in the botanic gardens are carried by triangulation across the harbour. There are pictures of Butler in the gardens during the surveying and in front of us standing there, you can see a little metal box in the, in the path. That's a survey mark in a little iron box. A series of letters to the editor of the, of the Sydney Morning Herald during 1925 well illustrates the central role which Butler held in the public understanding of the bridge construction. It begins with an article based on a press release from Bradfield, boasting a successful survey of the bridge centreline. The claimed accuracy of this measurement is disputed by one D.T. Sorkins, lecturer in Diodicy at the University of Sydney the next day, and this rebuttal provokes a response from a writer who signs themselves K.M. Buttfield, Buttfield, surely a contrived nom de plume, who berates Sorkins as a mere Bradfield detractor. Other letters appear and Bradfield replies until December when Smith's Weekly exposes the whole sequence as a hoax on the Herald. That K.M. Buttfield could be accepted by the editor and the public illustrates the familiarity with which K.M. Butler was known in Sydney. Smith's Weekly exposure of the spoof confirms the place of both Bradfield and Butler in the public perception in 1925. All Australia will remember the bouquets which were thrown when Dr. Bradfield produced his bridge designs. He was not the only Cyclops at this amazing forge. 
The creature genius was said to be equally shared by one, Dr. Bradfield himself, two, Miss K.M. Butler, his secretary. The Bradfield hyphen Butler bridge builders had claimed an error of only three eighths of an inch in the bridge center line of 2,268 feet. We will never know who K.M. Butfield was, surely not Bradfield, Butler, either or both of them, as the nom de plume is so patently obvious. But the episode, episode does illustrate the place that Kathleen Butler held in public perception in Sydney in 1925. And so Butler worked on the bridge and railway for the next two years. There are photographs of her at work in North Sydney and in the steel fabrication shops under construction at Milson's Point. On 7th of July, 1926, at Milson's Point, she, she ceremonially drilled the first hole in the first piece of steel fabricated for the approach spans. This was, of course, a staged photo event, but the three men present, super heavyweights, Ennis, Freeman and Bradfield, wanted her to do it. The most spectacular photos of her show her alone or in company in the massive excavations for the skewbacks of the main arch. Kathleen Butler's involvement with the Sydney Harbour Bridge ends somewhat sadly, I think, in 1927 when she decided to marry. In those times, married women could not be employed as public servants. In Kathleen's particular case, even if this exclusion were not in place, she would have, would have resigned anyway, as her intended husband, Morris Haggerty, was a grazier from Cunnamulla in far western Queensland, 225 kilometres north of Burke, so there would have been no possibility of her working in Sydney. I had a farewell from officers in both Sydney, Harbour Bridge and Metropolitan Railway construction branches. Bradfield expressed their good wishes and presented her with a grandfather's clock as a token of their goodwill and esteem, stating that Miss Butler's capacity uh, led to her attaining the position of trust and responses, responsibility she held and that her retirement would be a distinct loss to the bridge branch. The wedding was held in St. Mary's Cathedral, and the report of it is worth reading, if only for its amazing description of the clothing of the bride, the bridesmaids, and the mother of the groom. Her own parents by this stage had died. It also proves that in doing research, it pays to read everything. The wedding report points out the significance of the bells of St. Mary's pealing as the bride entered, for she was on the committee of the War Memorial Carillion. It is the only reference I knew until it led me to the university archives. Just how Kathleen adapted to the change from the excitement of building the bridge, the royal garden parties and all the rest to domestic life in a remote area is speculative at best, but I will try to report what I have learned. Kathleen was 36 years old when she married, so it is perhaps not surprising that she had only one child, born four years later in April 1931. Anne Josephine was born prematurely at Waverley, Sydney, after a problematic pregnancy. For a long while, it seems to have been touch and go whether the baby would make it, with Kathleen ex shuttling express milk to the hospital twice a day. But she did, living for 81 years until 2012. They did not get home to Queensland for a year. So Kathleen was in Sydney in August when she was invited by Bradfield to plant a tree at a ceremony at Milson's Point, where a lot of people planted trees as part of the final works of the bridge approaches. I did suspect that Kathleen was at the opening ceremony, based on no less an authority than Edith Bradfield, wife of JJC, interviewed in the Australian Women's Mirror. Edith stated quite stoutly that at the opening celebrations, there should be no women on the platform adding that only one woman had, has had anything to do with the actual bridge work, and that woman is Mrs. Haggerty, Kathleen Butler, who had so much to do with the bridge that she became known as the bridge girl. The author of the piece makes it clear that uh, Haggerty was on the platform that day. Uh, spot her if you can. I can't see her. I now know that she was at the opening because of a congratulatory letter she sent to Bradfield the day after the opening. It's in his papers in the National Library of Australia in Canberra. Rawson Hotel, George Street, Sydney, 20th of March, 1932. Dear Doctor, my heartfelt congratulations on the successful completion of the bridge. I want to say personally how pleased I was that your dream had been realised, but I could, gotten, could not get near the dais on account of the crowd. It was a memorable day in the history of Australia, and we are all proud of you 
and of the great work you have done in connection with the bridge. May you be spared many years to carry out your other work, which you so ably designed and which you sh should be yours to complete. What a glorious sunny day we had too. I was indeed happy to be present on the occasion and must thank you for arranging the tickets. I am hoping to return to Queensland about the end of April if Dr. Harrison's verdict about Anne's condition is favourable. Best wishes, your sincerely, Kathleen Haggerty. It is worth noting that the publican of the Rawson Hotel was Will Butler, Kathleen's brother, and that the manager of this on site was Naomi Hurley, their sister. So the family was rallying around Catherine, Kathleen in this difficult time with her baby. Edith Bradfield went on to say that the men who did the work, quote, needed constitutions of iron and nerves to match. This could only be maintained by a domestic atmosphere that ensured proper feeding, housing and rest. How many people who watched these men working like ants against the skyline thought of the woman at home who kept them fit for their precarious job? When the application of this to herself was pointed out, Edith, Edith added simply, I have minded a genius. For the man who designed the city railway as well as the bridge can be called a genius. Kathleen Haggerty returned to Sydney periodically and made her friendship with the Bradfields, John, Edith and Mary. In 1936, she was in Sydney and the Herald reported her as saying that she could not curb her interest in the new Queensland bridge at Kangaroo Point being built by Bradfield and Holt and felt that she, quote, hates to be out of it all. She was again in Sydney for the 150th anniversary of the founding of the city in 1938. Most references during these years are found in the social pages of the newspapers as their grazier's wife from Kunnamulla moved in those circles. In Nine, April 1953, where she, she was in Sydney to host a party in honour of her now adult daughter, Anne, who with her aunt was about to leave on the Aronse for England and the continent. In the words of granddaughter Maria, my grandfather, Morris Sloan, while an amazing grandfather, was a difficult man who liked things done his way. And my grandmother was also a very strong woman and they simply could not live together harmoniously. So about 1958, Kathleen returned to Sydney and lived in Helston Park. The house had been in the family since the mid-teens and was probably bought new by her parents once they retired from Mount Victoria in 1913. This was the house she had lived in for most of the time she worked on the bridge. Kathleen and Morris remained on friendly terms, and he would stay with her whenever he visited Sydney. Although living a thousand kilometres apart, they never divorced. In 1961, Kathleen and her now widowed sister, Gladys, bought a house divided into two flats together at 41 Wickham Road, Neutral Bay, suggestively close to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The area is now known as Caraba Point. This is the house, the house that's on the block now, I think it's the right one. Nothing remarkable about the house, perhaps, but rotate 180 degrees and this is what you see even from the street, and the house is high set and two-storey. I choose to think that Kathleen and Gladys bought, bought it for the view. Kathleen could not forget the bridge. Kathleen and Gladys relied on each other a lot and did everything together. Anne and her children would stay at Neutral Bay when they visited Sydney. Maria says, and Ma, because that's what she called her grandmother, Ma, Ma would walk my brother and I, that would be six and eight years old at this stage, would walk my brother and I down to the wharf and tell us stories about the construction of the bridge. In January 1972, the scrapbooks of her articles on the Sydney Mail were donated to the Mitchell Library. And on 19th of July, Kathleen Muriel Haggerty died at Mount St. Margaret's Hospital in Ryde. She was 81 years old and is buried in the Lawn Cemetery at Macquarie Park, North Ryde. Four years later, Gladys died and now shares the grave with Kathleen. Gladys, misspelled as Gladdy on the headstone, um, though in the family it was always pronounced Gladys, is recorded as the devoted sister of Kathleen. The seven children from Mount Victoria always seem to have got along and in later years of their lives, the two sisters particularly well. In her probate packet, her chattels are listed and valued, the 50 cents toaster and all the rest. The only thing of note is a grandfather clock, all faults included, estimated to be worth $40. It was a farewell gift from her workmates at Public Works 45 years before, 
and it survives as a treasure in the home of her granddaughter. Specific bequests were made to her three surviving children as siblings, Roger, Gladys and Arthur, and her grandchildren, Maria and Morris, and a niece, Kathleen Muriel Hargraves. Um, that's a very difficult family to research because they keep calling all their daughters the same name. And uh, Morris's sister was also called Kathleen. So at one stage, there were two Kathleen Haggertys around. Most striking detail of her will to me is the bequest of 200 pounds, a very large sum in 1964 when the will was drafted, to be used as honoraria for masses for the repose of my soul, such sum to be paid to such priests or priests as shall be chosen by my daughter, and I direct that such masses should be said as soon as conveniently may be after my decease. Kathleen Haggerty was a very devout Roman Catholic. If there is a final chapter in the story of Kathleen Muriel Butler, it came in 2019 with the construction of the metro from Chatswood through the city to Bankstown. The harbour had to be crossed with a tunnel boring machine, and those machines are always named for women. The TBM, which crossed the harbour twice, just beside Kathleen's bridge, was named for the bridge girl, Kathleen. The first time I heard the name, I knew instantly to whom it was referring and thought it thoroughly appropriate name. At that time, I did think that describing Kathleen as, as Bradfield's technical advisor was a bit of rewriting history to suit the flavour of the current world, but I think I've changed my mind since then. I can I end, I'll come to the end of this presentation by quoting researcher Alex Gooding. Of course, Butler's most unstinting supporter was Bradfield, who may have had to overcome prejudices of his own. In many respects, theirs was an unlikely professional relationship. On the one hand, a middle-aged male engineer with years of training and experience, who was a regular Church of England, England attendee, and on the other, a young, devout Catholic woman with no professional training. Yet not only did Bradfield recognise but Butler's ability and entrust her with enormous responsibilities, he also went out of his way to praise her achievements and to propel her into the public eye. Now, since I wrote these words, there has been another last chapter added. Um, Engineers Australia, and uh, written by myself, have nominated Kathleen for a, a blue plaque under the, the current scheme uh, being operated by uh, Heritage New South Wales. And we have every reason to believe that it's about to be awarded. So we're really pleased. And so that would be a, a fitting memorial to Kathleen Butler. Kathleen Butler, rest in peace and thanks for the bridge. Bill, uh, very many thanks. Uh, extremely well-researched and comprehensive presentation. And obviously you got great cooperation from the family. You take great pride in um, Kathleen's achievements, no doubt. Okay, I have uh, that was fantastic, uh, Bill. Really interesting. I really enjoyed that with my connection through my grandfather from uh, Dorman and Long, who was in, based in Middlesbrough. Um, just three quick, three questions within a question. Do you, do you know um, why particularly Dorman and Long were selected for the job? Secondly, do you know who the other tenderers were? And thirdly, do you, do you know how many people eventually came over from? Middlesbrough, Yorkshire, to work on on the bridge in in Sydney. Um, like roughly, yes. Um, why did Dorman Long got get the job? Because they basically they the tender they submitted was what what Bradfield asked for. Um, lots of other tenders. I can't quote. I think there were fourteen tenders, but um, they all sort of went moved away from well, not some of them moved away from um, Bradfield's specifications and. Uh, Dorman Long were very straight down the line and built what Brad wanted to build what Bradfield and asked for. Um, they were not originally going to build the bridge at all. They were not bridge builders originally. The the people who were going to build the bridge were the the Cleveland um, Bridge Company, also, also of Middlesbrough and fairly you know geographically close. Uh, mm. They they suggested the arch and um, they they unfortunately though the tender was nearly finished when their their principal. Um, Dixon, uh, Charles Dixon died suddenly. You know, only a few months out, so they withdrew. They they couldn't proceed without their, their driving force. But fortunately, uh, Dorman Long were persuaded to take over the tender, the whole, the people, the the documents, the works, all the calculations that had been done. The Dorman Long really stepped into the breach at the last minute. They may have been sort of on the point of moving into bridge building. They certainly, they probably would have made the steel for the bridge regardless. They and they may well have 
drilled and cut and all the rest of it, but not taken on the whole project. Um, how many tend? I, oh, I, 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 you asked how many other tenders were there were. Um, if you can get a hold of the report on tenders, it's available online. I think um, mm -hmm. it's all set out in glorious detail. Uh, for the the people from Dorman Long who came to Australia, it's really only the engineers, the the officers and managers. Um, mm -hmm. The whole work was done by basically locals. The 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 metal work. Um, the, the engineers and surveyors and, and supervisors and such were, were all from Dorman Long. Um, probably only 20 or 30 people, I think. Bill, uh, just going back to your um, the blue plaque, which Engineering Australia is going to award for the... Um... No, 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 Heritage New South Wales, not Engineers Australia. Um, where will that be located? Somewhere on one of the bridge pillars or... Uh... Well... Um... Uh, no, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be on the bridge because um, Kathleen left in 1927, and there was there was no bridge in 1920. No, you know there were holes in the ground. I mean, all the the legwork had been done, but nothing. Very little construction had started. Um, my suggestion for them was um, North Sydney Station, uh, where she performed the first act of construction, as we've seen in the slides. Um, they have suggested that it be on the wall of the old Public Works Department building. Which is actually when well, we we call it the um, Colonial Secretary's building, the you know corner of the building on the corner of Macquarie and Bridge. Well, apparently the the downhill end of that building was the original Public Works Department building. So, uh, if they want to do that, um, I'd be happy for them to put it there. Well, Bill, um, very many thanks. Um, excellent presentation, and um, it's outside our normal naval um, subjects, but uh, very well worth listening to and uh, I thank you a lot so many thanks all right thank you